Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, we're really glad you're with us for the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Your stool is ready, and uh, we are very happy to report to you that we have all good martinis today. This doesn't happen often. And we're probably about to get a lot of bad ones, depending on how certain stories go. So we are very happy to have three good martinis for conservatives today. Jim, now, as some folks know, sometimes a good martini is the fact that bad stuff has come to light or been confirmed. And so that's where we are in the first one. And so uh, take a little bit of grain of salt that this is uh, not an entirely good martini, but it's good that we know more about it. And Jim, this is an issue that you have had a great instinct on pretty much from the get-go of the COVID pandemic. Uh, The latest confirmation coming from research done uh, by Brett Baer, Fox News, special report into the early days of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, the, The written report says fresh questions are being raised about what American scientists and federal health officials knew about the origins of the coronavirus and whether conflicting evidence was suppressed and hidden from the public. According to the timeline of events laid out by Bear, Fauci was told on January 27th, 2020, so about a month and a half before lockdown, that his uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases had been indirectly funding the Wuhan lab through EcoHealth, a U.S.-based scientific nonprofit that had been working with novel coronaviruses. On January 31st, Dr. Christian Anderson, a noted virologist at the Scripps Lab, privately told Fauci that after discussion with his colleagues, Some of COVID-19's features look possibly engineered, and the, quote, genome is inconsistent with expectations from evolutionary theory. That's uh, scientific jargon for uh, probably didn't come from the wet market. Uh, Anderson added that the situation needed to be looked at more closely, at which point Fauci organized an all-hands-on-deck conference call with colleagues where he was told that risky experiments with the novel coronavirus may not have gone through proper biosafety review and oversight. Hours later, Fauci hastily organized a call with dozens of worldwide virologists and notes from the meeting obtained by special report reveal that suspicions of the lab leak theory were suppressed over concerns of how the public would react to news of possible Chinese government involvement. In the meeting, fears were raised by then NIH director Francis Collins that, quote, science and international harmony, unquote, could be harmed and accusations of China's involvement could distract top researchers. So basically at that point, they decided to smother it. So conspiracy theories don't run rampant. But, Jim, it's not a conspiracy theory when it's true. So uh, from the get-go, these people who have been told by the media are beyond criticism or questioning lied to our faces. Yeah, this this really should be a... Uh, hit below the waterline, so to speak, on the reputations of Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins. And I say this as somebody who was, I don't want to say bigger fans of them, but had more faith in them at the start of this pandemic than they than I am now. A steady erosion over the past two years. So a little bit, I'm going to reveal a little bit of news here in the sense that I have a massive piece in the magazine coming soon. I, I know it sounds like a really bad when I just say that I have a massive piece. Uh, I have a massive piece in the magazine on the lab leaks, and it's just basically trying to you know, summarize everything we've learned so far about the possibility of the lab leak theory. And a lot of it will seem familiar to people who have followed this from the beginning, but one of the aspects that I think has been understated is if you are a virologist and your interest was in studying viruses, EcoHealth Alliance was not the only game in town, but they were by far the biggest player in the field. And not only not only were they getting U.S. grants, they were getting private donations, they were getting uh, money from all kinds of places and allocating it and funding all of these research projects all around the world, all over, the you know, in China, but also in all kinds of Asian countries. There was kind of a hubbub earlier this year, I guess it was when uh, or late last year, when um, they found viruses in bats in Laos that were similar to SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. And from this, you had a bunch of people saying, aha, see, it couldn't be a lab leak. Look, we found bats in in Laos that have a very similar virus. This demonstrates that, you know, SARS-CoV-2 could have evolved naturally. It's just kind of like this stuff. Well, lo and behold, EcoHealth Alliance was collecting samples from all kinds of places, including in Laos. 
So it's entirely possible that viruses in Laos ended up in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And oh, yes, like I think it's safe to say that uh, if it wasn't the largest repository of novel coronaviruses found in bats in the entire world, then it had to be top two or three. Uh, repository. You had a ton of these uh, viruses sitting there in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The w World Health Organization's uh, inspectors got the most brief and cursory inspection uh, or even just kind of meeting or tour of it back when they were in Wuhan back in January 2021. We haven't had anything resembling a real investigation of this. And I think what you see in these memos is this recognition amongst just about everybody who is in the virology community. One, that there was a lot of gain-of-function research going on and that they were being fairly loose, fast and loose with the rules, shall we say, about what they were doing. We had the memos that came out late last year that indicated they were supposed to notify NIH if any of their research caused these uh, the growth rate to increase by a factor of 10. And EcoHealth Alliance's research with Wuhan Institute of Virology accidentally, or so they insist, increased the growth rate by a factor of 10,000 which is more than a factor of 10. So I think as soon as it became clear, you saw this not only in the comments from Fauci and Collins, but from just about anybody involved in viral research, that this was the nightmare scenario. This was, oh crap, somebody in our world screwed up and has set off a global pandemic. And if, this, if, if the public really gets a good look at this, nobody's ever gonna wanna fund any of our research ever again. We're all gonna be out of a job. We're going to be seen as the, you know, reckless monk. We're, we're going to be seen as like the plant administrators at Chernobyl instead of the noble, hardworking, you know, uh, wise and smart scientists that we are. That, I suspect, is why you've seen so many virologists saying, oh, pish posh. It just is unthinkable. And the degree to which there has been this effort to, as you said, smother this story or simply downplay it, scoff everything except say, hey, wait a minute. How do we know what the safety standards are in in the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Because the one time Americans got a good look at it, they you know, the State Department, they sent a memo coming back and saying they do not have enough people who are properly trained to do the kind of research that they want to do. This was in January 2018 and continued into March 2018. Those two infamous State Department memos. So anyway, so I, the entire you know, I've got a massive uh, piece of work that is currently going through the editing process. Uh, I'm hoping that this kickstarts some more discussion of this, but kudos to Brett Baer and Fox News for further calling attention to this and emphasizing, look, from the very beginning, there were a bunch of people who did not want us looking in this. And I suspect many listeners right now are saying, huh, well, if they didn't want us to look there, there must have been something notable there. And I'm not sure how this guy has any credibility anymore. Now, from our perspective, he pretty much lost it all, even without this, uh, given his flip-flopping on so many other things over the past couple of years. But, uh, I, I mean, he roundly, Fauci, roundly condemned the even discussion of this. I mean, there were people like you who were, um, I don't know if shadow banned is, is, is as far as it went, but, uh, I mean, you were laughed at and, and ridiculed, and uh, how could you think such a thing? And, you know, where do people go to uh, get their apology from Dr. Fauci here? Yeah, but we should emphasize, Greg, I get laughed at and ridiculed all the time. <laughs> but this is for the work. This is for the theory. This is, you know, that, you know, but the other thing also is that Fauci, when he said the U.S. had never funded gain-of-function research uh, through EcoHealth Alliance at the Wuhan Institute, it was the most technical definition he, you know, that, that he could possibly apply. By any you know, layman's sense of what gain-of-function research is, which is you have a virus, that naturally exists, but it's not dangerous enough to be of value in your research because you want to study the really dangerous stuff. Nobody worries about viruses that don't hurt people. So you, you know, either through various different form of processes, sometimes you just apply different solvents that kill off 90%. So you have that strongest 10%. You repeat this process over and over again to uh, accelerate the process of, of natural evolution, so to speak. But that would not leave any, you know, gene evidence. Now, the fact that these, some of these virologists will look at this and say, wow, this genetic code, these spike proteins, they don't look like the sort of things you'd expect to see evolving naturally through nature. You know, there are some virologists who say, no, no, actually, if it is a very similar spike protein structure, we shouldn't be by that shocked by it. I don't like getting into the the argument of is this genetically engineered or is this not? Because people kind of picture it as like taking the genes and putting them together like Legos or something like that. As I described in the lab, you can accelerate the natural process of, of natural selection, right? This idea of the strongest and most hardy 
and most durable are the, are the genes that you know uh, uh, get passed along. You can accelerate that process artificially, and you're not going to leave any fingerprints. Um, you're just going to end up with a virus that is much more advanced in than it would have been if it was just floating around in bat systems in the jungle somewhere. So that's what we've got here. And I think that Fauci, uh, if he did not commit perjury and lie to Congress, then it's only because he was, you know, by the most technical and, you know, hair splitting definition, the NIH did not specifically set out to fund gain of function research. You know, it'll, it'll be, you know, Colleen Bill Clinton said it depends on what the definition of is is. You know, whether or not Fauci lied entirely depends on how you define gain of function research. And for the purposes of that answer, he defined it exceptionally narrowly. All right. Well, after that, that's a good that's a, that's a good martini, by the way. <laughs> Good that it came to light. So uh, good job, Brett Baer and staff of Fox News. You've earned a nap. So uh, use your my pillow. Use your Giza Dream Sheets. Uh, if you need a, a good hot shower to uh, ease the muscles after doing all that work, uh, towels from my pillow are also the way to go. Uh, and also the new my slippers. Absolutely the most comfortable slippers I have ever worn. I look forward to wearing my slippers now. Uh, can't recommend them highly enough. And right now, when you use our promo code Martini at MyPillow.com, you can get 40% off the new my slippers. These slippers have spent two years in development to ensure the highest quality and comfort. They're designed to be worn all day, indoors, outdoors, or wherever you like. These slippers are available in moccasin or slip-on style. And they're available in a variety of colors and sizes. The My Slippers are made with quality leather suede, an exclusive three-tier cushioning system. This includes the My Pillow patented fill, the Impact Gel, and the Memory Foam. So for a limited time, My Pillow is offering 40% off the new My Slippers. Go to mypillow.com and click on the radio listener square. Enter the promo code Martini or call 800-874-0104. Now, while you're there, take advantage of the deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the Giza Dream bed sheets, the MyPillow mattress topper, and the MyPillow towel sets. But you can only save that 40% on the new My Slippers with our promo code Martini. So use the code Martini when you call 800 874 0104 or at mypillow.com. All right, Jim, on to our second good Martini now. And this one actually uh, is good all the way around. There are a lot of House Democrats heading for the exits. Now a total of 29 who will not seek re-election. There may be a few who are seeking other offices, but uh, for the most part, they can see the handwriting on the wall. They know, based on the numbers, like we saw from Chuck Todd on on Monday and and from his show on Meet the Press on Sunday, uh, that when the president's approval numbers look the way they do and the right track, wrong track numbers look like the way they do, the incumbent president's party is going to take a quote-unquote shellacking in the midterms. Add to that, of course, that we are looking at uh, redistricting in a number of states. And so you are seeing some folks who would normally be considered safe deciding to call it quits. The latest example of this, Jim Cooper of Tennessee, first elected to Congress in 1982. Uh, He must have left town at some point because uh, he says he's leaving after 32 years in office. So um, the the math doesn't quite add up there. But anyway, 32 years in Washington is plenty. Uh, And so, Jim... Uh, The Republicans in Tennessee have successfully chopped up his district into three, meaning that Republicans, given the the rest of those three districts, ought to have a pretty good chance to win them. So well done. Uh, That's to the victor goes the spoils in the state legislative races. And we're seeing the Democrats do as much as they can in California, Illinois, Maryland and some other places uh, to to counteract uh, what are likely to be Republican gains here. But uh, in the end, uh, the people who can uh, see reality uh, certainly have a pretty good indication of what's coming in November unless there's a drastic change in the political atmosphere. Greg, you mentioned, uh, you know, House Democrats who are running for the Senate right now. Out of the 29, we should point out four of them are running for the U.S. Senate. Four are running for some other office, usually governor or some other statewide office. And way back in my days at Congressional Quarterly, one of my favorite you know stories to write was to talk to the uh, Democrats Senatorial Campaign Committee and then talk to the DCCC and just say, "How do you feel about the other guys trying to you know dissuade your your, your recruits?" 
know, and the, the Democratic senatorial campaign committee would, you know, grumble and say, well, we understand they want to keep their house, you know, their their house uh, numbers, you know, retirements low. But these are some of our strongest candidates. And of course, I'm stuck with DCCC and say, hey, can't these guys find candidates somewhere else? It was kind of fun to, you know, jab at them. And they, you know, for the, one of those rare cases where two branches, the two parts of the party are working at cross purposes. Uh, look, 29 is a lot. I don't know if it's another record. I, the, the ones, it probably, one of the way that seem to be coming fast and furious now, pun not intended, but I'll apply it anyway. And uh, the observation is that I think if you were debating, uh, it, it's getting close to the filing deadline. It's getting close to when you're going to have the earliest primaries. So it's it's going to make sense that if you're a House Democrat, you 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 know how redistricting is working out in your state. Obviously, you know, for a bunch of House Democrats, it's not looking great. Even if you do manage to hang on, you're probably going to be in the minority in the House next time, next cycle anyway, and that's no fun. So you add it all up, we shouldn't be shocked in particular by Cooper. I think the numbers are getting really gargantuan for the Democrats, and I do think this is uh, just another indicator um, that uh, if you are a, you know, this is a, this is a fragile House majority to begin with, and it was going to have a tough time withstanding the usual process throw in a president with low approval rating, throw in, uh, you know, border crisis, inflation crisis, supply chain crisis, um, Afghanistan, Ukraine, uh, the fact that Omicron hasn't gone. I mean, hopefully by November, you know, COVID-19 is entirely in our back, in our rearview mirror. But, you know, people are not going to forget, you know, the president Biden promising to shut down the virus and then not doing that. So all in all, just look for an absolute probably the worst political environment for Democrats in a long time. Add it all up. It's not surprising that a guy like Cooper's leaving. The fact that he survived previous waves indicate is kind of an indicator that he always had a, a strength that other, you know, Democrats in the House didn't have. I think everybody on the wall can see it unless, you know, but this is also an indicator that like Republicans should be running, you know, a candidate in every district and they should be running, you know, well funded campaigns against in even in states like Maryland, even in states like uh you know, run run them everywhere because in a wave election like this, you'd never know who's going to end up getting elected. Very few people expected Larry Hogan to win in, in Maryland back in 2014. You know, in a wave years, you can get wins you never thought you're going to get. So keep that in mind, Rep- Republicans. Yes, choose wisely in your primaries. Uh, not getting the memo, of course, is Nancy Pelosi. She announced yesterday that she is running for re-election yet again. Jim, she's doing it for the children and to save our democracy. But something tells me if she's not. Still in the majority, she's going to hit the bricks pretty quick in the new Congress. Yeah, I, I, it was kind of it was a really weird thing to see yesterday because there had been all this talk about like, OK, she's one of the few House uh, House speakers to preside over two disasters for the party, not just one. <laughs> um, you know, 2010, uh, t- you know, with the losing the House, uh, you know, 2014 kind of <laughs> wiped out the, Repo- the Democrats in the Senate. And, you know, they won back in, in uh, 2018 and she became a speaker of the House again and the infamous, you know, tearing up the speech behind Donald Trump. She's an octogenarian now. It's time for her to ride off into the sunset. And she chose not to. And there's been a whole bunch of Democrats, a whole bunch of progressives, a whole bunch of centrist Democrats who say, look, she's clearly been a liability. She shows up in every Republican ad. Re- like the group that might be most sad to see Nancy Pelosi leave the House would be the ad makers for the National Republican Campaign Committee. <laughs> Do you want to vote for Nancy Pelosi to stay as speaker? You know, that, that's that's been their messaging since 2010. And she's this she's a, literally a San Francisco liberal who lives on a street nicknamed Billionaire's Row. Right? Like she, she can't you know, she's terrible communications. She used the hair salon when the place was supposed to be shut down. Like she's terrible at this. She steadfastly defends uh, House members of right to buy and sell stocks, but she's terrible. So in a way, this is kind of a good martini. This is a bonus good martini <laughs> that she's not living. I think you're right. I don't think she'd be all that interested in sticking around as House Minority Leader. So I think she might retire. But I wonder if she's doing this as a signal to kind of buck up, uh, buck with a B, uh, to buck up Democrats. Like the, the midterms won't be such a disaster, but... You know, I, I I really have a hard time believing this is going to make much of a difference one way or the other. Yeah, that, that strategy doesn't usually work very well. But, uh, yeah, she's had a couple of doozies just this term. You mentioned uh, the trip to the salon. There was also her 
uh, getting the ice cream out of the freezer, uh, her massively expensive freezer. But here's the other thing, Jim. Remember when there was the the big fight uh, with the progressives when the Democrats took control of the House after the 2018 midterms? And she said, I'm going to stay as Speaker for just four years, and then I will hand it over to the next generation. If, in some unlikely way, the Democrats stay in the majority in the House— what do you think the odds are that Nancy Pelosi intends to stay on as speaker? I think it's entirely uh, likely that she's going to stiff arm the progressives yet again, even though she is one. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm torn between go away, Nancy Pelosi, and stay, Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> Otherwise, we need a new villain. Uh, the squad, the squad is shaping up to be excellent villains. That's a good point. That's right. Uh, once, you know. once they're in the minority, I think those uh, those people are going to get uh, higher and higher. They positions. won't be so sensible and moderate. You're saying, Greg. <laughs> Yes, when Nancy Pelosi is frustrated by you from the from the right, you know, you know you're pretty extreme. But uh, whatever, uh, she is uh, she is hopefully bound for the uh, minority again. She's been the Democratic House leader since 2003. It'll be 20 years come January next year. Okay, now let's move on to our third and final good martini today and we know we've thrown a lot of polls at you lately but uh, they just keep coming and each one kind of tells us something just a little bit different so this one's from pew overall biden's at 41 percent approval 56 percent disapproval but then they break it down into a number of critical issues and he's underwater on all of them some of them by a lot and uh really staggering in some of these issues is how the uh, strongly disapproved versus strongly approved numbers are extremely lopsided. Handling of the public impact of the corona outbreak, 55-44 now underwater. Imagine, I mean, a year ago he was way above uh, 50% on that one, well into the 60s. Make good decisions about economic policy, also 55-44 underwater. Handle an international crisis. Do you have confidence in his abilities on these things is basically the question. 56-43, no. Effectively handle law enforcement and criminal justice issues, 59-41%, no. Work effectively with Congress, 59-41%, no. Make wise decisions about immigration policy, 59% to 40 uh, no. Who are those 40%? Deal effectively with China, 60 to 39% no. Bring the country closer together, 69 to 30 no. And then in another issue uh, that, uh, and thanks to Hot Air for aggregating this as well, they simply asked people, this isn't really uh, an opinion, it's just what have you seen? Uh, majorities in both parties easily seeing major price hikes for things they absolutely have to have. For food and consumer goods, 94% of Republicans, 86% of Democrats seeing major price hikes. 89% of Republicans, 78% of Democrats on gas prices. Housing, a huge one. 83% of Republicans, 77% of Democrats, and on and on it goes. And so, Jim, what the American people are saying here, it seems, is that life is getting harder and they have no confidence in Joe Biden to do anything good about it. This is a really, really, really bad poll. And I, I think you know, it's funny. We've had our share of, let's just say, controversial presidents in the past. Um, there were plenty, you know, plenty of Americans who did not like Donald Trump and who at least half the country was like, oh, everything he does is wrong. Uh, similar story for Obama, similar story for George W. Bush. But I, the significant number of Democrats are losing, either losing faith in Biden there's always a certain number of people who will use every question as an indicator of I like this guy or I don't like this guy, right? I think there was a you know, really fascinating poll. They looked at people's assessments of the economy from December 2008 to like February 2009. Now, the only thing that really changed, the recession was still going on. Uh, the only thing that really changed is that Barack Obama became president. And almost overnight, Republican assessments of how the economy was doing got worse and Democratic assessments of how the economy was doing. It's like they flipped a switch. As soon as Obama took the oath of office, significant number of Democrats said, yeah, the economy is improving. So when people ask, how do you feel the economy is doing? Very often that is, do you like the president or not, is what people are hearing or, or thinking in their heads. You've gotten to the point where enough Democrats aren't willing to have that kind of cognitive dissonance. They aren't willing to insist things are getting better when they really aren't. Now, maybe they found a way in their heads to blame Republicans, even though they don't run the Senate and they don't run the House. They cannot deny that prices for food and gas are higher. 78% of, of Democrats higher costs of gasoline, 77% of Democrats higher cost of housing. 
Now, we can argue how much the president himself is a result of that, but there was a supply chain we noticed last fall. People were warning people, you know, you know, buy your Christmas presents early because a whole bunch of ships are backed up in those ports in Cal- off California. Oh, by the way, they still have a whole bunch of ships backed up off the coast of California. Um, almost all of these things are, are this pro- now problems that are so glaring and people feel it in their pocketbooks that they can't the sheer you know negative polarization and the drive of partisan partisanship cannot convince them to, p- to pretend it's not happening they may they may find oh it's the republicans fault in some way but they you know democrats can no longer say it's fine every once in a while you still see some you know hard lefties on twitter and you know go to the supermarket they see a big produce section and say oh see everything's fine if you've gone to your store and you found like much less milk than you usually do Coffee creamer, I noticed, was was short. Um, at my gym, they have a little kind of, you know, healthy food cafe. Yes, every once in a while I try to eat healthy. I know it's hard to tell. And uh, they had no napkins. But people notice it and they feel it. And they get a little bit annoyed when they can't get the stuff they usually do. And that's, you know, the idea that, you know, the Democrats try to deny it or insist, oh, this is all hallucination. Oh, it's all just a temporary. The truck didn't come in on Tuesday. It'll be in on Wednesday. Look, people feel this stuff in their bones. And they notice it's not getting any better. But I have some good news, Greg. Biden went out for ice cream yesterday. <laughs> not a shortage of ice cream, I guess. At least not I yet. Mean, thankfully, Greg, that's one supply chain that either was OK or Biden just went there on the right day. <laughs> I guess so. Three good martinis, uh, some of them with a little bit of bitter aftertaste, considering the condition of the country right now and uh, and the fact we were lied to for a couple of years. But nonetheless, uh, definitely some some good news at the root of all three. So we will take it. And Jim, we will hopefully have more good news tomorrow. See you then. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, do uh, subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Tell your friends about us as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Find us on your home devices. All you have to say is play 3 Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Wednesday, and please join us on Thursday for the next 3 Martini Lunch. If you give power to the federal government, you never get it back. I'm Sarah Carter on the latest Sarah Carter Show. Arizona Attorney General Mark Burnovich joins me to discuss his battles with the Biden administration over COVID funding and his fight to keep Washington from taking away the constitutional power of the states. I'll also address Biden's disastrous press conference and much more. Follow the Sarah Carter Show at Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.